Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to look at the phenomenology of mesmerism or animal magnetism as it was reported in the 18th century. My guest, Adam Crabtree, is a psychotherapist with a private practice in Toronto, Canada. He is also a trainer of psychotherapists, working with the Center for Training in Psychotherapy in Toronto, and is the author of numerous books, including most recently, Evolutionary Love and the Ravages of Greed. His other titles include From Mesmer to Freud, Magnetic Sleep and the Roots of Psychological Healing. Another title is Trance Zero, Breaking Through the Spell of Conformity. In addition, he is the co-author of an anthology called Irreducible Mind and is co-editor of another fascinating anthology called Beyond Physicalism. Welcome. And Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Very few people are familiar with the details of the history of mesmerism or animal magnetism to the extent that you are. I saw your annotated bibliography. I think there were over a thousand articles that you had reviewed. Yes, that's on, right. On this field. Yes, and it goes back to mesmer, and uh, mesmer was came forward with his first important work in 1778, so it goes a long way back. Mm -hmm. And the anthology is, includes titles in French, German, and English, and a few Italian. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't appreciate today uh, w what a huge fad animal magnetism had become in, in that era. Uh, yes. We're aware of the consciousness movement and the psychedelic drug movement and the human potential movement and even the spiritualist movement, but not so much the uh, phenomenon of mesmerism. That's true, and it's unfortunate because particularly his pupil who studied him, um, studied under him, named the Marquis de Puiseguir, had a tremendous effect upon our world today. He had what I consider the first human potential movement. Mm -hmm. He started it. And he was opened up the notion of what the human psyche is by his discoveries of what he called second consciousness and what I've come to call the alternate consciousness in the psyche of human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, let's de define that because uh, it, I, I know people at that time thought it was quite extraordinary that there was a whole other realm inside of people of which they were unaware. It was unknown. Mm -hmm. He was the one who actually first drew our attention to it with his book uh, in 1784 on the history of animal magnetism. And that book was extremely influential. Before that, the notion that we have another world of mental activity and of intention mm -hmm. and of creativity even, then, then our ordinary consciousness was simply unknown. Mm -hmm. But under uh, hypnosis, as we now think of it, uh, people were able to uh, report things and do things that uh, consciously they didn't think they could do and uh, were unaware of. Yes, well, that's right. This is one of the interesting things about the phenomenology of mesmerism. It included, for instance, what today we would call paranormal abilities because Puiseguir himself even was aware of the phenomenon of telepathy of people who were in this, what he called the state of magnetic sleep, mm -hmm. that somnambulistic state. They had the ability, in his view, to read his thoughts. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really think that much about it. Today we'd say, oh my gosh, that's really strange. For some reason at that time it just seemed that was part of what was going on and he accepted it. Mm -hmm. He also noted that the people that he put into that state of magnetic sleep were able to diagnose the illness of others themselves, but mm -hmm. also other people, mm -hmm. and prescribe effective remedies for that. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of 
on the basis of just looking at them. In other words, there wasn't any examination, and the and the person who was doing it had no particular skills mm -hmm. of a medical kind. And they were in a trance state. They were in something. a trance state, that mm -hmm. state of magnetic sleep. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Which was, when you say magnetic sleep, the term magnetic in those days meant something very different. It did. That was referring to magnetic fluid that Mesmer talked about, who, which he believed pervaded the universe and was the source of life, mm -hmm. and which would be used in healing because magnetic fluid is coursing through us all the time, and if it's moving freely, we're healthy, mm -hmm. and if it's blocked, we're not. And so the healer would try to remove blocks to that movement of magnetic fluid. Mm -hmm. So uh, amongst the uh, other kinds of paranormal phenomenon uh, reported, uh, what did you encounter? Well, there were, they used to call them, in the early days of the study of uh, those phenomenon, they called them higher phenomenon and lower phenomenon. The uh -huh. lower phenomenon were things like, for instance, the person would be uh, go into a different sort of personal state. They seem to have a different kind of personality. Mm -hmm and other sort of changes that we would say, well, that's unusual, but not particularly impossible. Mm -hmm. The higher phenomenon were things like where they seem to be able to pick up directly physical feelings in their magnetizer. That is, mm -hmm. they did experiments, believe it or not, where uh, the magnetizer would magnetize the person, that subject, that magnetic subject, then would not be uh, looking at them or anything like that, and they would jab a pin into the magnetizer, and the subject would jump mm -hmm. and feel a pain where that pin on his own body would have been. They called that community of sensation. Community of sensation. Yes, it belonged to sensation that belonged to both together. Mm -hmm. The magnetizer, or what we might call the hypnotist, put the pin in themselves, and the other person felt it. Exactly. And would jump. That's right. That's right. And the higher phenomena also included like telepathy and clairvoyance and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. So those were accepted, accepted pretty well in the first decades of the exploration of animal magnetism as just something that happens and that needs to be explored. Mm -hmm. There are other phenomena also which we would not say were uh, necessarily paranormal. Mm -hmm. but. There, in the practice of magnetic sleep over the years, the, the different practitioners began listing the kinds of phenomena that were characteristics of people who go into yep. that state. Yep. And there were many lists. Mm -hmm. And if you would add up all the different phenomena, like some of that we've been talking about and more, there were hundreds of mm -hmm. phenomena that were, that were noted. Well, uh, you know, when a person is under hypnosis, you can give them suggestions, almost any suggestion. Uh, Suggestibility is mm -hmm. definitely one of the ones that repeats a, a great deal, that's right. Heightened uh, perception, uh, anesthesia, mm -hmm. analgesia, mm -hmm. amnesia. These were the things that they began discovering and were part of the lists mm -hmm. of phenomena that was connected. And, and typically these lists would continue as the uh, process evolved from uh, animal magnetism to somnambulism to hypnosis. You yes. You, under hypnosis today, many of these same phenomena appear if the researchers are interested enough to suggest them. Yes, they are. They are appearing. And those phenomena uh, were always noted in the literature. Mm -hmm. And when, in particularly in the, in our, or the 20th century, when they started to try to study hypnosis, mm -hmm. as it came to be called uh, at that time in the early 20th century, uh, when they started trying to do laboratory work with a person in a hypnotic state, they were they had to face the problem, how do you, you define hypnosis? Mm -hmm. What is the basic characteristic of yeah. it so that when we know when a person is in that state, and then we can experiment on them mm -hmm. and see what they do yeah. and see what responses mm -hmm. they have. Well, the problem is there was no accepted definition of hypnosis among any of the practitioners over the centuries, yeah. nor among those scientists who were carrying out hypnotic uh, experiments. So they ended up trying to define hypnosis in terms of a list of phenomena that would mm -hmm. be the orthodox one, which would say, yes, if this person has these phenomena, they're definitely in a hypnotic state. Mm -hmm. The problem with trying to define 
something like hypnosis through lists is there are hundreds. How are you going to determine which are the legitimate yeah. ones or which are the defining ones? Mm -hmm. It's impossible. And yet, over a period of some decades up into the 1950s and 60s, a list did develop that was considered by workers to be the norm mm -hmm. and the orthodox a way of defining as, as I recall such things as arm levitation yes. like that was postural sway mm -hmm. these came to be the accepted uh, defining phenomena of hypnosis and one thing you might notice about those that became the defining orthodox way mm -hmm. none of them had paranormal uh, aspects well too. as as main, uh, it, it, mainstream researchers took over uh, they for the, their own protection had to eliminate those things uh, uh, so their careers wouldn't be threatened I mean as I recall even though animal magnetism became a medical practice over 200 years ago it wasn't until 1954 that the American Medical Association officially recognized hypnosis as, as a medical therapy right right yes so they were trying to be orthodox they, they yeah. were trying to be accepted to the established medical establishment and it's very well known that the medical establishment has always had a difficult time with paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to say, well, we'll use telepathy as one of the phenomena. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a lot of arbitrary choice that went into these, this yeah. eight or ten mm -hmm. um, phenomena that were going to be on the list that mm -hmm. would define it. Now, I, have, I believe that that is a fatal flaw for doing experimental work with hypnosis. Mm -hmm. if, you, if that's your definition, how do you know then if what I'm doing in my experiments mm -hmm. are exactly the, I'm experimenting with exactly the same yeah. state that what another person is doing in their experiments? I think that's, uh, you can't overcome that. And flaw. it seems to me, uh, to the best of my knowledge, even today after 200 years, we don't have a good theory of how hypnosis works. That's, that's right. If you, if you just take the phenomena, we don't. But I came up with a mm -hmm. definition yeah. of hypnosis, which is not dependent upon phenomena. And this is something that uh, I believe is successful. Mm -hmm. it's, it's new. It's certainly uh, not, not known by that many people. It's been yeah. published in, in various places. But I think that it covers the whole gamut of those phenomena we're mm -hmm. talking about, covers them all, and it, uh, it doesn't depend on any one particular mm -hmm. combination of mm -hmm. them being there. Mm -hmm. That's the great thing about it. So mm -hmm. that if you fulfill this definition of hypnosis, mm -hmm. or what I would call trance states, then we are working with the same thing. If, if you are working with someone in your scientific research that fulfills that definition, mm -hmm. and another person is, then you can, you're talking about the same mm -hmm. phenomenon. And, and I, I would hazard a guess to say it has to do with the narrowing of attention. Yes. Now, my definition of trance, first of all, the trance state, is a state where you're focused on something, and to the degree that you're focused on it, you have diminished awareness of everything else. Everything else is somewhat peripheral. Mm -hmm. And that focus draws out of you a response to it that allows you to deal with it in whatever way it requires. For instance, if a person is uh, acting a part in a play, mm -hmm. they're focused on that part and they get into it and they become that person and right. all, all kinds of unconscious things are yep. working there yep. to make that part work. Mm -hmm. So the focus gives mm -hmm. them the opportunity to bring forward from their inner resources all they need to be a good actor. And this happens in so many things in life. We mm -hmm. focus on something, we bring forward without thinking about it, mm -hmm. we bring forward the proper resources and we take care of whatever yep. it is we're focused on. Mm -hmm. That's my definition of a trance state. And my definition of hypnosis is that it's just one species of trance. And uh, maybe I could talk about the different kinds of trance in order to uh, distinguish it. Would, no. that, would that be useful? Well, I think we get planned to do a separate interview. Okay. On, right. on that topic. I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's let, uh, let us go back for a moment. Yeah. 
and talk about uh, some of the other phenomena yes. as associated with yes. uh, hypnosis. For example, uh, uh, Frederick Myers, uh, I think, was among the first to look at telepathic hypnotic induction. He was. He, uh, he and Janet actually did experiments on that mm -hmm. telepathic uh, hypnotic induction in the in this 19, excuse me the 1890s. Yeah. Um, and they found that they could in fact succeed in bringing about a uh, hypnotic induction where the person was at a distance and the person didn't know anything about the, mm -hmm. their attempt. But and was being observed. But they were being observed, yeah. and they did go into that state. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that uh, was a successful, uh, you might say, confirmation mm -hmm. of the relationship between hypnosis and telepathy. Yeah. And now earlier we talked about the community of sensation. If I yes. am a hypnotist and I prick myself, the uh, subject will feel the prick. Yes. Uh, now, to my knowledge, that was widely reported in the early years, uh, but hasn't really uh, manifested more recently, maybe because of cultural prejudices. And maybe because the hypnotist didn't want, want to have all those pink tricks. <laughs> well, there's that too. But now, how can you explain that just in terms of the narrowing of focus? Well, I think that the uh, that you can't explain that just by the narrowing of focus. What you can say is that you're creating a state in which there's an attunement mm -hmm. that occurs, mm -hmm. even though you don't know how you're creating that state and just what the focus is. The focus is a connection or a rapport mm -hmm. that you know, mm -hmm. but beyond that you don't know what the unconsciouses are doing to yeah. make that happen. Yeah. In other words, it wasn't necessarily predictable, but it just turns out mm -hmm. that when you have this kind of connection and focus and rapport, that those phenomena occur. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I, I believe is commonly associated with hypnotic trance is uh, the production of visual and auditory hallucinations. Yes, that's right. This is called ease of, <clears throat> uh, ease of imagination. Mm -hmm. the, it seems that we are able to imagine things better mm -hmm. when we're in a hypnotic state than you can in your everyday state, you might yeah. say. Now, I recall uh, one of my early experiences as a you know, budding hypnotist when I was in college. I, yes. I hypnotized a friend and suggested to him, probably rather naively, that he would become a, a cat that oh, was, yes. okay. had been prowling around our apartment. And, and uh, this person all of a sudden got on all fours and started l jumping from one bed to the other the way that particular cat did and, and actually began behaving as if he were the cat. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, which I suppose uh, you could say he was acting. Well, he was acting, yes. And there were articles written about people acting, but really feeling the, the mm -hmm. thing. Uh, not just acting like you and I might act out yeah. something, what we conceive of as mm -hmm. a cat, but actually getting into that part in a way that is beyond anything they could con consciously. Method acting, yeah. Yeah. you might say, yeah, that's where, right. you, where you become the character yeah. you're yeah. playing, in which case, this case, a non-human character. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Well, these phenomena were described in, in articles by very reputable people through mm -hmm. the 19th century, or the 18th century, excuse me, through the 19th century, the 1800s, and most of those things have been forgotten. Those articles still exist in some of the journals, mm -hmm. the medical journals of the day, but you don't find much reference to them anymore because I think that it's hard to fit those things into the prevailing notion mm -hmm. of what the human psyche yeah. is and what is possible and what is not possible. Well, and, and another uh, of the phenomena, in addition to producing positive hallucinations, aren't there also, I, I, maybe the term is a negative hallucination where you can c suggest to a person that they cannot see or hear something that is within their field of uh, awareness? Yes. Genet did a lot of experiments with that, with negative hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very interesting because 
he was able to have, uh, the, the, let, let me give you an example of, of what he used. Uh, he had uh, the person in a hypnotic state and there was a, a, an individual in the room that this person knew and this individual is wearing a hat. Mm -hmm. And so he suggested to this person that so-and-so was not present in the room. Yeah. Okay. So he said, when you come out of the trance state or the hypnotic state, you will, you will not see Mr. So-and-so. Uh -huh. Okay. We, now you're bringing up the idea of the post-hypnotic suggestion. That's there. They're also in that. That's yeah. right. That's uh -huh. right. So when he came out of that state, he looked around. Uh, Genet said, well, is Mr. So-and-so here in the room? And the man mm -hmm. said, no, he isn't. But, but he looked over and he saw the hat. That the, that the man was wearing, uh -huh. and the hat was moving. <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't figure yeah. out what was going on, why that hat uh -huh. was moving. He, in other words, the, the, he had lit, taken very literally the yeah. suggestion that yeah. he was gone, but his hat was still there. Mm -hmm. His hat was not removed from his consciousness. And uh, the idea of creating a negative hallucination to cause somebody to not see the man, but still see the hat. Yeah is, uh, I mean, it, it strikes me as somewhat uncanny. I, yeah. I don't think I'd call it paranormal, but no. it seems like it's right on the edge. Well, it shows the tremendous powers of the psyche that we have not yet explored. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that multiple personality is another example of showing the tremendous powers of the personality. We cannot ever produce the uh, multiple personalities mm -hmm. like they exist in nature. Yeah. And that's because we don't know enough about the psyche mm -hmm. to do that. Well, I'm also thinking now of a, a phenomenon that was reported in uh, the 1969 classic book, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Right. They called it artificial reincarnation, where people in a hypnotic trance would be uh, given the suggestion that they were some great artist or composer from the past, and then they would be uh, brought out of trance and said, now, okay, paint a picture or compose a sonnet or uh, or a, a symphony even, or, you know, whatever, uh, maybe just a, a small musical piece. But they were able to show levels of creativity that went way beyond uh, their normal personality. Yes, I think that's an example, again, of the much deeper and greater richness mm -hmm. of the individual than we can imagine. Yeah. I uh, have been using hypnosis since high school and particularly using it when, when I was in school for helping me to prepare for examinations so that my mind would be clear, my memory would be good, and, yes. and I have to say, it worked brilliantly. Yes, yes. It's marvelous. Mm -hmm. when you discover in yourself yeah. how, how much there is that you don't know about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and that's self-hypnosis. Yes. So, uh, I mean, I suppose one, one could say there's a, a, a continuity between animal magnetism in the 1780s and self-hypnosis as many people practice today. Yes. I think there is definitely a continuity. I think also that there was, when, when they were practicing animal magnetism, that they they found that the phenomena were produced were more amazing than tend to be produced by hypnosis today. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly because of their technique, which involved a sense of energy exchange. Mm -hmm. When you're, you're mainly dealing with psychological states as they do today, I think that certain aspects of the psyche don't get activated to the same extent mm -hmm. as they compared to what they were doing back then. And, and I suspect maybe things have changed in the culture at large, where uh, there was just in, in the 18th century a little bit more openness. As you mentioned, Puseguir thought nothing of the fact that uh, his uh, hypnotic subject could uh, read his thoughts. That yes. Today, you know, people might not be so willing to uh, be so accepting of that. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. There's another way that I believe that there's quite a difference between then and now, and mm -hmm. that is in post-hypnotic amnesia. Mm -hmm. um, back in those days, when Puisagir was doing his work, he said very explicitly and emphatically that anybody that he put into the somnas somnambulistic state and some action would take place and he would bring them back out, mm -hmm. none of them could ever remember anything that occurred. 
Oh. They always had complete amnesia. Uh -huh. Over the two centuries since then, that has changed. Mm -hmm. So that now, uh, it, it, I think it's something like 10% of people don't remember what mm. happens in the hypnotic state, and 90% do. Yeah. And I believe that that's a, mm. because of the development of our culture, mm -hmm. which has become much more psychologically uh, sophisticated, so that when you go from the state of trance to the waking state, mm -hmm. we know about that. We know a, more about the unconscious than they did back then. Mm -hmm. The time of Puishigiri, nobody knew anything about it, so yeah. it was like going from one world to another. Mm -hmm. Now it's like going, make, taking a step from into a somewhat strange uh, territory. Well, and, and another similar example might be uh, anesthesia under hypnosis. Yes. I mean, in, in the 19th century, major surgeries were performed using a hypnotic process for anesthesia. They were, yes. Painless. And, that's right. And, and today, of course, it, it's not necessary because we have uh, good anesthesia. Yes. Uh, but to the extent, to my knowledge, that experimenters have attempted to reproduce that phenomenon, they've not been so successful. No, some of that has been done in, in China, apparently. And I know one instance that where it's been done right near where I live. Uh, Victor Rausch is a dentist in a town near Toronto who had his gallbladder removed under self-hypnosis without pain. Mm. Now that's very, very unusual. So it, there are still people who are doing this. He is someone who used hypnosis a great deal in working as a dentist to uh, remove so that people would not have pain when he's doing uh, the so procedures. So it's, it's still done. That's right. It I is. see. Yeah. Well, once again, Adam Crabtree, what a fascinating review of uh, the potential of the human psyche. Thank you so much for being with me. You're welcome. Thank you for uh, having me here. And thank you for being with us.